React India. Hey everyone, thank you so much for having me. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a new core web vital metric that is INP, and I have been working as a front end engineer as at Disney Plus Hotstar, and apparently Ankit is my manager, and he's really pissed about the performance of my application. So he gives me sleepless nights and lots of work to fix the performance of the application. So I will be talking about interaction to next paint and how is our journey to fix it, how to measure it, and most importantly, should you really care about INP at all? So let's get started. So how often on your web page, you end up with an interaction that looks like this. You're pressing a button, nothing is happening. It's taking significant amount of time. User will get frustrated, right? It's not a great experience at all. So today I'll take you through my journey in making this interaction buttery smooth. And this is, by the way, a living room device. A living room device could be your TV, your Xbox, or even a PlayStation. So operating on a living room device is a little different from how you are, we are usually used to on the web. We have to do it with a remote, right? We don't have a cursor. So we don't have this liberty to select the elements directly through the cursor. That's why we do it with the remote. And it's less intuitive than a regular experience that we are used to on the web. Let's move forward. Yes, but first we need to understand what exactly interaction latency means and how it's related to INP. So interaction latency is nothing but when you make an interaction on the web page, and you see the changes on the screen. So what is the duration that it took for the device to paint the next frame onto the screen? That is precisely what we call as interaction latency. Now, to understand it better in technical terms, let's look at this diagram. So when you press a button on remote, that is registered as an event. So I suppose there would be a key down event listener associated with that. As a side effect, when you execute this callback, there would be a significant amount of time that it will take. As a result, there could be change in your component state, uh, and that would mean you need to change something on the actual DOM as well. So that calls for a layout phase, wherein you have to, uh, the browser has to work to get the layout tree, the new updated layout tree, with all of these new elements. And then again, it will try to get that layout tree and paint it as a bitmap on your screen. So that is precisely what is, we call as a render phase. Once render phase is done, the next frame will be presented to the user. OK, now that we understand what is interaction latency, then what is INP? So INP is nothing but the measure of the application's responsiveness. If you have a good INP, low INP, that means your application has been able to respond fairly quickly to all the interactions. and this is what Google recommends. So if your application is performing well under 200 milliseconds, well, I think you're doing good. Your application is pretty fast. And if you're performing under 500 milliseconds, you can do better. I mean, user would be able to notice the lag. Over 500 milliseconds, it's a bad territory. User will have a context switch and probably will not be using your application. So in our case, it looked like more than uh, it looked like a poor experience, so we definitely need to fix that. But now that we understand what's INP and what's interaction latency, so how are they correlated? Well, in layman's terms, well, this is a very simplified uh, way of explaining this, but interaction, uh, all the interactions that happen on your web page, the INP algorithm tries to report the worst interaction that is happening. So suppose you are reporting 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. So, INP algorithm will consider the INP as 200 millisecond. And well, we already had a core web vital metric known as first input delay. Then why was INP introduced? What is the need of having another metric? So to explain this, we are living in an era of single page applications. That means 90% of the user's time is spent on the page after it has been loaded. So that means we need to have a more holistic metric, which measures the responsiveness of the application throughout the page lifecycle. That is exactly what INP does. 
if you look at this diagram, when you uh, suppose a user makes an interaction, you have something already queued on the main thread. And we know JavaScript is th single thread, right? So on a main thread, if you are already having a task that is being executed, at that point, the actual event callback might get executed at a later point of time because, hey, something is already on the main thread, right? So this is what we call as input delay. The FID was the metric which measured the first input delay on the page. So it was like a page load metric. It was not like measuring throughout the life cycle of the application. So that's why I think INB is more holistic and makes sense. And just when we front-end engineers learned to optimize about FID, INP got introduced. And as I said, Ankit was bugging me to fix the INP of the application. All right, so it's demo time. I would recommend everyone to scan this QR. You can play with this small application that, cre that I have created. And I will get started as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, you can still scan the QR, by the way. And this is a small application to show you the behavior, how it's like to interact on a living room device. We don't have the liberty, as I told you, we don't have the cursor. So we have to navigate with on-screen buttons. You can interact with the application with up and down arrows. You can see there's a small icon on the bottom left as well. Once you press that and make an interaction, the application is fast. Once I press that again, uh, it looks like the experience is janky. And we can also see this on the small spinner that you see on the top right. This is a depiction of your main thread. It's spinning, and that means we are able to present the frames to the users, and uh, the painting is going fine. If it stops, it freezes. That means the main thread was unable to paint the next frame and present the next frame to the user, which is what we uh, anticipate as a lag, right? So again, this uh, this is a small example. You can see it's uh, we can we will try to fix this. Well, uh, spoiler: this is already fixed because you can switch to the performance mode, and you can see it's behaving well enough. But I will leave you guys with a later exercise to tell me what was the culprit of the long interaction. You can, we can sidebar on this. So let's understand, now that we know, at least uh, looking at it, we know that this was not great. But how can we measure it? So there are a few ways. You can measure the lab data. Lab data is precisely in your controlled environment on your local machines. And on your runners, you can get that data to understand what is the great uh, what is uh, a good interaction what's going wrong and you can do that with a chrome web vitals extension this is the easiest way to get started and i will show you a small example with this application as well so you can get this this is the chrome web vitals extension and once you open this up and when you make an interaction it shows something known as an interaction, as we can see. One second. Yeah, I will make an interaction. I see it's 24 millisecond. It looks good. I'll press toggle this mode again, and let's see how the interaction looks. Oh, it's poor. It's 1,000 milliseconds. Not that great. So this is the easiest way to get started. There are other ways as well. You can use something known as performance observer. Uh, I'm not sure if you're really shipping this with uh, to production with uh, the older runtimes because I guess it's not supported on the older runtimes. But you can definitely consider this in your controlled environment to measure the uh, interaction latencies. And I will show you another demo with this. I've uh, already integrated this performance observer in this dummy application, and we can see the interaction latencies being reported. We can also see which was the event that was culprit of these interaction latencies. And once we switch to the performant mode, we can also see the interaction latencies fairly improved. Great. So this is another way we can measure interaction latencies. Also, once you are able to identify the long task in your long interactions in your application, it becomes really important to pinpoint which uh, elements are the culprit of these long interactions. Thankfully, 
This is where performance profiling comes into picture. You can also profile these interactions. And thankfully, in Chrome, let's try to profile this application. Oh, and by the way, try to make this as slow as possible, because you never know what is the actual device of the user. This is like, again, $2,000 MacBook. I'm expecting it would be really fast. So it's good to uh, mimic the slowdown so that you can actually see how it's like on the actual user. So let's profile the application once. Mm, made an interaction. That should be enough. It processes the profile. I can see one long task. We can leave this long task for now. It's because of profiling. When we actually profile, there's a profiling overhead as well, which we can ignore for now. But what I'm really interested in is that the interaction also shows that I made a pointer interaction. And this was a one second interaction latency. And this induced a long task. It was a result of click. So click event handler that I necessarily had. And down this flame chart, I can also see what was the culprit. Hmm, interesting. I can see there's something really expensive happening in all the card components that is causing this delay. So again, to summarize, again, you can use Chrome Profiler. This is really helpful, I think. Uh, you should all be using this for measuring the lab data and getting the culprits of the bad INP. Additionally, there's another way of doing this. Because in a fairly complex application, this was a silly example, by the way. It's a simple application, right? So uh, you might not see a very big flame chart with component trees. But in a fairly complex application, it's not that easy to determine the culprits from the profiler itself sometimes. At that point of time, maybe you can use the React Dev tools. And again, I think we can use it on our application as well. And I've already profiled it. So we can see the cards were the culprit. But in a fairly complex application, as I mentioned, the component tree will look a little more complex than this. And you would be able to know if there are possible things that got re-rendered, which you do not want to. Yeah. So that was it for the lab data. But I want to stress a lot of emphasis on field data. Field data is the actual metric on how the experience is like on the actual device. So we never know how the end user is going to uh, experience our application due to hardware limitations. There could they could be running on a low-end device and things like that. So it becomes really important to get the field metric and field data from the actual devices. And this is where uh, we have the Web Vitals plugin to the rescue. So Web Vitals plugin allows to uh, allows you to integrate and get these INP values. There's a uh, already support for INP, which is being added now. And using this, you can get the field data from the actual user's device and how it's like, uh, how the INP is like on the actual devices. And you can pipe this data to your analytics pipeline. For the, so for a sample application, I'm using the Firebase setup over here. And you can see it's reporting the uh, INP data from uh, throughout the week. And you can make sense out of this data. Now, there's another problem to solve. And that is, so this application was reporting INP around 56 milliseconds, which is fairly good. But suppose it wasn't that great. We need to have more attribution. By attribution, I mean a segregation on the culprits of bad INP. So throughout the application, users will be interacting on, let's say, page one, page two, and uh, lots of pages, right? So how do you get to know? from which page did that bad INP uh, originate. So for that, you need to add additional attribution data. And attribution, thankfully, Web Vitals plugin also provides some level of attribution out of the box. But you might need to add your own custom implementation. In our case, we do. So some of the attribution that is already available out of the box, we can see. You can get the details like event type, what was whether it was a click event, whether it was a key down event, and things like that. You can also get event target, which is precisely your node, your DOM element, 
from where this bad INP originated. This will be really helpful. And I can tell you from my experience, it was really helpful for us to determine what is the P0 interaction on our web page. And things like load state as well. So load state is like your DOM was ready, or your DOM was interactive, or your DOM was still loading. So things like that can also be really helpful so that you can further segregate and understand where are you going wrong and what are the next avenues to fix. All right, with that, I want to introduce you to the trail or tale of tray interactions. This is our story of optimizing the trays interaction that we already saw, which was not that great. And to explain it better, well, as I mentioned, we already have this attribution data. So through this attribution data, we were able to uh, understand that a lot of samples are coming from the home page trays, which happens to be a P0 interaction on our web page, which we need to fix. And it was reporting fairly high INP. So this is how we identified that this is, again, a next avenue that we should be fixing. And we were also presented with another problem statement, which is fairly limited to a context of a living room device. So a living room device like a TV, a target device can severely lack performance because you uh, the runtimes, the browser runtime is baked into the device, right? Users cannot update their TV Chrome runtime to a newest version of Chrome, right? It's already ba baked into the device, right? And CPU isn't that great. Memory could be as low as 350 MB of RAM, which is, again, not that great. So that's why field INP numbers weren't that promising from the low-end devices. So this is, again, problem statement that was severely uh, hampering the user experience, as we already saw. And this makes me question, why should we even care about INP? Does it even relate to the business at all? So to understand this, well, think about it. If you are unable to browse the content on the Disney Plus Hotstar application, would you be able, even able to watch the content? Well, not really, right? So that means less conversion, people will be, and the bounce rate will be high, and I think this being at the very top end of the funnel, we should definitely fix it. So again, if your top end of funnel serves the experience like this, people will not be using your application. They will get frustrated. And this is not great. And you can see in this example, let's play that again. We can see I'm pressing this button again and again. So we call this as a rage interaction. So if a user is performing the same action twice, or even thrice, they often get confused whether their previous interaction actually got registered. So that actually adds an overhead to the main thread, because not only now the main thread has to do the work from the previous interaction, but now the rage interaction long task also came in. They have to perform extra work to, f to get that running on the main thread. This is not that great. So let's understand how is the component structure on the trays that we have. We have a fairly long list of cards and trays on the home page. That means there could be hundreds of trays and hundreds of cards within each trays. That's why we have an in-house virtualization for both cards and trays. So what that essentially means, we only render four trays in the DOM. The other trays are virtualized, so as user is make an interaction going from one tray to another, we render, we remove one tray from the DOM, we add another tray to the DOM. That is how a virtual list operates. But don't you think that's extra work to be done on each interaction? You have to remove one tray, you have to add one tray, right? But this is a trade-off we live with, so this is exactly what we are going to fix. And let's understand this from the technical standpoint, how the profile looks. Again, this is a very simplified version of the profile. To make thing, uh, keep things simple, I will explain. So we have something known as spatial navigation. We'll get to that. But this is taking a considerable amount of time, as we can see. Then there's a re-render that is happening, which is bound to happen because we're changing from one tray, to, we're switching from one tray to another. Then the tray above the fold is taking some time. There's a new tray that is getting added. That is possibly taking some time. And finally, there's something known as Spotlight. So let's go back and see. There's a big image on the top right we can see uh, of the title that you are actually focused on. This is what we call as a Spotlight. 
and this is also taking some time. Uh, we can do better on this, so let's see how can we fix this. So there's a general framework around optimizing INP. If there's anything you can take away from this talk, it would be this. So do less work on each interaction and you get good INP for free. Also, if you're not able to absolutely avoid and get rid of that work, just do it, uh, do it in small subtasks so that main thread is able to breathe and it's not holding its breath for too long so that your, the user is present with a new frame. So there could be something which could be non-critical work. You should be scheduling it for a later point of time. And let's see how can we use these strategies to fix this application. So problem statement one, we have spatial navigation. I will explain what spatial navigation means. So on a living room device, as I mentioned, it's not that intuitive because you have to navigate with the remote. So you have to, fo so you have, uh, suppose you want to go on the eighth tile. You have to press the right arrow on your remote eight times to get there, right? Uh, so it's less intuitive, but this is how we do it on the, uh, on the living room device. So this is what we call as a spatial navigation. Thankfully, we have a library, third party library, which implements this on the web. And how would you do that? Well, it measures the distances from each corresponding node. So you have, suppose, eight trays. And it will measure the adjacent trays, uh, what is the distance from this tray fr to the next tray, and understand which is the next go uh, possible candidate which should be focused next. So doing that could be expensive. Well, let's understand from this profile. So the act of measuring itself from DOM is really expensive, using things like offset height, offset width. This is really expensive for the DOM. Well, why? Because browser tries to give you the most up-to-date information. That's why it does a style and layout check again. And this is what we call as a forced synchronous layout. And it's evident in the profile. So this is something probably spatial navigation is doing. And at the very bottom of the profile, we can see a forced synchronous layout happening, right? And if you do these four synchronous layouts again and again, because spatial navigation will try to measure for all the adjacent nodes. So that means you're doing FSL again and again. That is what we call as a layout thrashing. Layout is created, layout is again thrashed, layout is created, layout is again thrashed, and things like that. And this is not that great. So how can we fix that? Well, you remember, right? Less is more. What if we can uh, remove all of that? We can avoid all of that work, if, even if that is possible. So this is what the tree structure of our current application looks like. We have the trays in the spatial navigation tree. We have the uh, cards in the spatial navigation tree. So the idea that we proposed was we will take the control of navigating the trays and cards. We will do this work on ourselves and not let the spatial navigation third party library do it for us because it's really expensive. How can we do that? Well, it's as simple as taking control of the key down handler uh, and maintaining the active tray because it's spatial navigation, right? We, we cannot jump from one tray to the first tray to the third tray. That means every key down press will be controlled by us. We are stopping the propagation on line number 15 which means we are not letting spatial navigation event listener take control of this interaction, and we, we are doing it at, by ourselves. This way, we are able to avoid the, all the work that spatial navigation was doing and essentially have the control on the tray and card interactions. We, are, we have extended this capability for both trays as well as cards. And uh, as a result, this is how the spatial navigation tree looks like now. We have just a single node of tray container, which is containing all the trays uh, in the spatial navigation tree. We have less nodes, that means lesser reflows. And within, when, when you are navigating within the trays, there are no reflows, because we are taking control of the key down listener. And this is how the profile looks now. We are, we have been able to get rid of all the work that spatial navigation was doing. No ray layouts, that's great. No four synchronous layouts now. 
but still it looks like it's still a long interaction uh, we can do better on this so let's see how can we do that well i touched about i talked about virtualization a little bit so let's understand why virtualization is uh, overhead an extra work that has to be done on each interaction because a tray above the fold has to be removed and tray below the fold has to be added right that's extra work that has to be done but how can we fix that is it possible to defer that work to happen at a later point of time well yes it's possible we built an abstraction which is a simple component which mounts the component or re-renders the components at the next tick so that means at very next subtask this piece of work will be executed uh, in the main thread so what that means a tray above the fold will be removed from the dom in the next subtask because it's less critical work right and tray below the fold the user cannot even see that tray by now so that will be mounted to the dom in the next tick how great is that we are able to get rid of all the work that was happening in a critical fashion and this is how the profile looks now we still have the interaction interaction is only contained to container re-render which is, means you have a animation when you go from one tray to another so that still happens we have some things known as spotlight updation and all the non-critical work like removing the tray and adding a new tray is happening in the next tick in the next subtask okay but we still see this problem because we're doing a spotlight updation it looks like it's something expensive can we also fix that well yes sometimes the solution of fixing such things could be really simple and it is as simple as adding a debounce why let the spotlight updation happen is uh, synchronously let it happen at a later point of time that should be cool once you do that again the interaction latency looks re much cleaner it's no longer a long task the interaction latency looks fine to me in the profile and this non critical work as is done at a later point of time but we run into a new issue doing this because what light updation might run at a later point of time what that means is it could uh, affect the later interaction so for instance uh, spotlight updation is queued on your main thread at that point of time the user made an interaction it can induce an input delay so how can we fix that well this problem statement can be solved by using generator functions and to understand this what if the idea behind generator function is to pause the execution of the uh, pause the ex uh, execution of the function in between how can we do that well using the generator functions it provides a, provides a capability to add checkpoints that means uh, you yield to the main thread and at that point of time you decide whether you want to continue or not and you, when you do this iteratively in a looped fashion you can check uh, so at line number uh, 13 we can see if the task has been aborted that is when you no longer do the work so by using this what we can do is at a later point of time when a user has made an interaction we can mark that the uh, the function uh, spotlight updation as tail and we can abort this so we no longer have to do that extra work that is queued on the main thread so again generator functions are really powerful and you can make use of this for aborting things that are queued on the main thread and as a result of doing all of this this is how the interaction looks now i think it's much smoother and looks fine to me so this is with the lab np let's see if we really had any success with the field np so this is with the actual de uh, user devices we saw a 4x dip in the interaction latencies for the trace which is really good and there's a business outcome as well which is really amazing that weekly card views also went shot up by 100% so, th so that's really great that uh, that ensures that users are able to 
uh, view more content and browse more content on our home page. Looks like a step in right direction. And also, this is something I did not really see coming. But doing all of these INP optimizations also resulted in some performance gains. So page load times dropped by 30%. I don't know why. Well, I know now. So we eliminated the four synchronous layouts that were happening due to spatial navigation on the initial page load. Now that we are taking control of this interaction, so they are no longer happening. And also, the spotlight updation is queued at a later point of time. So that's great. We're not holding the main thread for too long. So that means the page load times will also drop. And once we have done all of this, I think it's really important to understand how can we prevent the INP from increasing again. So if you work in a fairly large team, it becomes really important. And things can really go south, because you never know. There could be a feature that a partner team could be shipping, and that can possibly increase the INP. So how can we fix that? Well, you, it would be really nice to have some guardrails and some automation to do it for you so that you don't have to manually review all the PRs. Well, you can do this by using a custom implementation of a GitHub action, which will use the Playwright framework. For example, in our case, we use Playwright framework. And it generates a lighthouse report on each PR. On each PR, we are able to see what are the interaction latencies. You can set the thresholds. So for instance, for a tray interaction, you can set a threshold that I want my tray interactions should be well under that threshold. If it fails, then your PR will probably look like this. It will fail, and you can make it as a mandatory check, and they will not be able to merge it unless they have force merge rights. So yeah, this is one way of preventing INP regressions. And it goes without saying, we should also acknowledge some of the current limitations with INP, because it's still an evolving metric. So I think attribution is really tricky to solve. We're still solving it. We are not there yet. But to understand why it's tricky, we never know on the actual user's device what's going wrong, what's, what's going on the main thread of the actual device, right? So things like this, we are uh, not able to fix with the current attribution system that we have. And also, act of measuring on the actual user's device doesn't come for free, right? We, we are measuring, that means we are doing some work on the main thread, right? So yeah, that is about uh, attribution. Also, to prevent regressions, I mean, that can hamper the code velocity if you're working in a fairly large organization. Because if the test environment is flaky, for instance, the users will not, not be able to get their PRs landing to the uh, trunk. Because again, because the test environment is failing, they will budge you for force merging their PRs. So again, end-to-end -end test can be tricky because of this. And with that being said, I'm really excited about INP. INP will replace the first input delay as the standard core web vital metric in March 2024. And I think it will be uh, adopted by more and more applications going forward. So that's a wrap. Thank you so much.